what is up, ladies and gentlemen? We got some shit to talk about, and we have a good card coming up. It's actually a sleeper card. A lot of good fights on there. A lot better than last week. Um, we went 10-3 and three last week. We did not um, hit the Holly Holm fight. Uh, kind of an odd approach, I got to be honest with you. I was not expecting her to take that approach. I knew she might try to wrestle. But not in that situation, not the way she did. So it was kind of interesting um, to see her take that blueprint. But like I said, we're not in her corner. We're not coaching her. We can't tell her what to do. We could just watch and see how it unfolds. And that's the way it unfolded. It didn't work out for her. So congrats to Bruno Silva. Where Holly Holm from goes from here, we have no idea. But we do have a good card on Roast this week, Saturday morning. It's in London. So guys on the East Coast, especially guys like me on the West Coast, we got to get up uber early for that. Um, so be prepared. If you guys are playing DraftKings, get your lineups in. If you guys are wagering, make sure you get your stuff in. Uh, get it in early because it is an early, early start time. Uh, they are going to be looking to showcase the over-the-pond fighters, which obviously we expect. They, you know, It's over there. They want to showcase some of their guys. Um, so obviously it is you know, uh, UK heavy. Um, the one interesting spot on this card that I do see is, and we're going to get into it. We're going to get in the whole main card. We're going to actually start with it right here is the Tybora and Aspinall fight. Now, when you look at this fight, you got to look back a year ago. Just a year ago, this guy literally tore his ACL and tore his MCL. Now, that, depending on the severity of the injury is where the recovery period uh, takes and also the refractory period of when you can actually start recovering from it. Um, this was a pretty serious one. It was pretty significant. He had surgery on his knee, um, tore it up pretty good. Now, when you look at the time frames of everything this is a point in time where this was literally a year ago to the month so how much time did, did Aspinall really get to kind of put in motion a full camp where he can actually go hard on it feel comfortable and feel confident on it you really don't know you know I know for myself I did I got a litany of injuries I mean I broke my nose three times I had a, a talus break where I was in a wheelchair I tore my ACL I, I mean I broke numerous amounts of bones the two injuries that hindered me the most in recovery was my ACL, MCL, and my talus bone. Those were the two that really took me like physical therapy and you know rehabbing myself to really gain confidence on my knee and my ankle again for explosion. Everything else is kind of, you, you, you don't have to worry about the functionality and utilizing of it, but your knee is such an intricate part of your functionality in the cage and sports and everything that you do. So the refractory period on that, you know, for him to be down after the surgery, you got to look at it. it's a couple months, you know, you know, maybe a month before he could really like a month before he could really start at least trying to walk on it. Um, and then you got a brisk walk and then you got to kind of take your lead from there. You can't just jump back in after an injury like you're getting a cast off your arm and go on your legs full tilt. You just can't do it. Not only that, but it's a mental thing, too. You wonder, is it stable? Is it going to hold up? Am I going to be able to pivot? Am I going to be able to explode? What if somebody puts me in an e-bar? Like what's going to happen then? I know for myself, when I ended up breaking my talus bone, I went up back to grappling. I flagged my ankle. Like, I literally made it perfectly clear. Guys, do not attack my ankle, please. Don't. Because I was, even though my ankle was stronger now than it was then, because obviously I got, I got hardware in there. It wasn't breaking again. It's a mental thing. You just, you think about the injury. The same thing with my knee was, you know, I literally was afraid to explode on it for a while. I was afraid to run. I was, a, and it was my explosion leg. You know, so, you know, there's a lot of mental that plays into it. It's not just the, you know, you're healed, you can go. It's also the mental capacity. Am I going to be able to take a kick in that? Am I going to be able to take a kick in that leg? Am I going to be able to explode off that leg? What if I put a heavy load on it and I go to pick someone like Tybora up and that load is on my knee and I turn the wrong way? Is it going to, is it going to give out again? So there's a lot of mental play as well. But also you got to remember, these are big guys. These are guys when they're on their back, when they're, you know, out and they're down and out, they really can't stay in shape. They could ride the bike a little bit. They could do certain things, but they can't have that heavy load on the knee like a lighter guy was. So their recovery period is a little longer, which means they gain weight. They kind of fall out of shape a little bit. You could do little things to keep yourself in shape and keep yourself from not being sedentary, but you're not full on active. So by the time he got healed, by the time he was able to go full tilt, <clears throat> we really don't know. So I just think it was a bad move on the UFC. I understand they wanted to put him on the card. I get it. But I think it was a bad idea to throw him right away in a five-round fight right off a knee injury. I, I, don't, I don't think it was a good idea, especially someone like Tybora. Tybora is a guy 
this dude is tough. Like, Tybor is a tough dude. He does not get the credit he deserves. Tybor won me a lot of money, you know, um, you know, in the past, just from the mere fact that everybody sleeps on this guy. This is a guy who, really, his issue is he makes boneheaded decisions in the cage sometimes. Well, uh, but he is a very good grappler. He's athletic for his size. He's got power. He's got decent hands. His cardio is eh. But the guy overall is a very well-rounded fighter. He's a very dangerous fighter. He's not an easy out for anybody. The guy's healthy as well. Now you got a guy in Aspinall who he's got to come in. He's got to test all these things. I don't care what he does in practice. I don't care how much explosion time. he. Maybe if he did get a full camp, there's no way that in his mind he was going full on, full bore the entire camp. You just, you, you, mentally you can't. And then you, there's also, you, there's a weaning period. You know what I mean? So not only did he have to get to the camp, but he had to also work his way to getting back in shape, getting his conditioning up, getting the confidence back on his knee, getting all these things just to get through this camp. This is, and all he has to do is all in a one, a one year span. It's not easy to do, not for, not for an athlete, not for a bigger athlete that carries a heavy load on his leg. So this is a fight where, Talent wise, if he never got hurt, it would be a no brain pick for me. I'm going Aspinall. He's over at the pond. He's in front of his people. He's the prospect. Tybor is always going to be a really, really, really tough guy. But there is a big question mark here for me. I, you know, I am still going um, Aspinall in this spot um, because I understand the, the nature of the business. I understand what they want, and they're bringing him in a main event spot. They're kind of rushing him back to a five round fight to headline this card. Um, even though he was calling for it, like he wanted to headline this card. I just didn't like that it's a five-round fight right out of the gate. You know, it's a five-round fight right out of the gate. For someone coming off knee surgery, that's not a, that's not a good thing. Um, and if he comes out full tilt and, and he's completely healed and he has 100% confidence on his knee, then, then fine, then great. Then he should absolutely be Tybor. But there could be a, a period in there where he's going to... There's a big difference when you're sparring and there's a big difference when you're in the gym to live, when somebody's actually trying to hurt you. Somebody's actually trying to finish you. They're, they're loading up on their leg kicks. They're really trying to... And listen, you know, if you're a fighter, I don't care how nice you are. I don't care, you know, what kind of guy you are. When you're fighting and you're fighting for prize money and you're fighting for another spot, maybe for a bigger fight, you're going to attack that injury. So if Tybor is in there and he's smart, he's going to work on that leg. He's going to kick that leg. He's going to test that leg. He's going to do everything he can to make Aspinall shy away, put that leg back, or kind of be a little bit of hesitant to attack him in certain spots because he's going to know now, look, I'm coming after that leg. I'm not, I'm not playing any games. So I don't care what kind of fighter you are. You can be a, a, a prick or you can be a really nice guy. When you're fighting, this is your job and this is for prize money, you can bet you that Tybor is going to test that knee. So, you know, it is a very interesting fight here. I, I, I would be pleasantly surprised if we see a, like 100% Aspinall. I don't think Aspinall needs to be 100% to beat somebody like Tybor. Uh, I think he's a little bit more athletic. He's, he's a lot more nimble and quick on the feet. Uh, he's obviously got good Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He's got good wrestling. The guy's game is completely encompassingly well-rounded. But the problem is the knee. Is he going to be 100%? Is he going to have the confidence on the knee? And what happens if type 4 comes with the game plan that I'm going to start chipping away on that knee like a wood chipper and see what happens? So it's a dangerous fight. It's a fight ultimately I'm probably just going to stay away from from a wagering perspective. Like I said, you got to show me after an injury, after an, especially a knee injury, you got to kind of show me that you're back to where you are. There's some athletes that never come back from knee injuries or, you know, like that. So... You, he's got to show me. I'm picking him to win here, but I would also tell you guys to just be a little hesitant on it. Don't go jumping in. I know a lot of these people are Tom Aspinall, Aspinall, Aspinall. Aspinall before the knee injury, absolutely. But you got to remember, the guy's coming off a knee injury. It's the same thing like Yuri Prohoshka. This is a guy who throws with a, a ton of thunder. Apparently, his injury, Dana White said, it was one of the worst injuries he's ever seen. We have no idea what he's going to look like when he comes back. He might never be Yuri Prohoshka again. He might be a shell of himself. I'm not saying that's the case for Aspinall, but maybe for this fight, he might not fight to his potential because of the injury, because of his timing might be off, because his conditioning might not be fully there. You know, so I'm going to back up on it a little bit. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to pick him to win, but I highly advise you guys, guys to like handle this one with kid gloves. But my prediction is Tom Aspinall. All right, the co-main event here, we have Molly Meepo McCann and Story Lanko. Now, I mean, it's not hard to decipher what the UFC is trying to do in this fight. I mean, they're bringing McCann in to win. She's the co-main event. She is not a co-main event fighter, but she is a crowd favorite. 
Uh, Molly McCann has the uncanny ability to be a middle of the tier fighter and have a outstanding fan base because of who she is, because of her persona, because how fiery she is, how much she loves to fight. She's very relatable. You know, she's very relatable. And win or lose, the UFC loves her and people relate to her. And it's all about the fans. It's all about what's going to put asses in the seat, what's going to make, you know, people watch. And Molly McCann is somebody that people do want to watch. They don't want to watch someone like Storylanko. Now, when you look at this fight in its entirety, where is Storylanko, um, you know, where's her advantage here? She really doesn't have one. I understand that she's a grappler, but really, is she a grappler? This is a girl who she's an advantageous grappler where she needs to have a submission fall into her lap. She's not one to wrestle, put you in a position where she's going to transition and go through steps you know, like a real fundamentally sound grappler where she's going to bait you into something. She's going to make you, you know, turn a certain way and because that's what her setup is. It's not the way she grapples. She's the type of person where you have to give her something. You have to let something fall into her lap. And if it does, she'll recognize it, she'll grab it, and she'll submit you. Um, people have gotten to her blueprint kind of quick because she is on a losing streak. She really does not belong in the UFC right now. Uh, and I think this is going to be her exit. Uh, after this fight, Molly McCann, on the other hand, not a great grappler. We obviously saw her against my hometown girl, Aaron Blanchfield. Blanchfield, Blanchfield is a girl that I've been following for a long time. Um, I picked her in every single one of her fights in the UFC, just for the mere fact that I know how good she is, and I knew how good she was before anybody knew how good she was because she's from my hometown. Uh, the Bergen County area has produced a ton of very good female fighters, such as Danielle Kelly. Uh, Aaron Blanchfield and a few others that I know that aren't even here yet. They are coming, and I posted something on Twitter about one of them. Um, the product of, of mixed martial arts within the females in the Bergen County area is very thick, and I've had a beat on Aaron Blanchfield for a long time. So Molly McCann losing to Aaron Blanchfield is not a big deal. Um, a lot of girls are going to lose to Aaron Blanchfield, and you could you could chalk that up right there. Um, you know, the thing with Molly McCann, though, when you look at that, people may fear that a little bit. They may say, well, Story Lanko does have a submission game. She got completely rinsed and repeated by Aaron Blanchfield. She had no answer for her. She couldn't get any, any transition. She couldn't find any escape routes. She couldn't shrimp. She couldn't do anything. Um, Story Lanko is not that type of a grappler. You know, this is a girl, like I said, it has to fall into her lap. You have to do something dumb and give her something. You have to give her a limb. You got to give her something to latch onto because that's what she's looking for and that's what she's waiting for. She is not one to create it, you know, uh, and that's the difference for me in a really good grappler and an advantageous grappler. A really good grappler is going to create the situation. They're going to create the submission themselves when you don't even know it's coming. Um, an advantageous grappler like Sri Lanka is someone where it's got to kind of just fall into their lap. You got to do something. You have to make a mistake for her to actually latch onto something. So Molly McCann, by all rhymes and reasons, she's got the advantage clearly on the feet. Um, so that's where she obviously wants to keep it. And this camp, she should have really just drilled takedown defense. And if it does go to the ground, to just keep your limbs tight, keep everything centered, make sure you don't have one arm in, one arm out. Make sure both arms are either in or both arms are even, or, or, or either in or both arms out. Little minor, minor grappling 101 details is really all Molly McCann needs to win this fight against someone like Storylanko. So I am going uh, Molly McCann. I, I can see her knocking her out, but I can also see her just starching her for a 30-27 through the entire fight, just getting out of all the bad positions, putting Storylanko in bad positions, backing Storylanko up, even getting top control on her for a little while. Um, so I do see a situation where Molly McCann can finish her later on in the fight. Uh, but I also see just a, a just a, a, a run over by Molly McCann. I don't think Storylanko has anything for her unless, like I said, Molly McCann comes out. Sometimes she does. Comes out very overzealous, very amped up, and she kind of tries to beat her at her own game, and she tries to just play anything, any which way but loose to the fight comes to her. Molly McCann just goes in and jumps in. Then, yeah, she could run into something, and absolutely Storylanko can submit her. But I just don't see that happening. I think if you're smart, if you understand what she is, who she is, and how she fights – there's a clear blueprint to beating her, and it's basically just don't let a submission fall into her lap. So I'm going to go Molly McCann um, in this one by, by pretty decisive decision or finish. All right, this fight, <clears throat> this fight's a fight that I'm really, really looking forward to. I'm actually very, very interested in this fight. This is a major measuring stick for Nathaniel Wood. Nathaniel Wood versus uh, Andre Touchy Feely. Um, I was always a Feely fan. Uh, this is like that old school meets new school. That's his style. 
Uh, coming from uh, Alpha Male, this is a camp that literally really dials in your wrestling, concentrates on wrestling, almost like the old school Quest guys. Though, if you're coming from Alpha Male and you're coming from Quest, you know these guys have some sort of wrestling in their back pocket. Um, you know, Andre Feely is a guy that is always competitive. I mean, if you look at, you know, his record and you look at, you know, his resume, yeah, you'll see a, a sea of red in certain spots. You're like, dude, what is up with this guy? But he's always competitive. He's always competitive. He's fought, in, you know, he's fought so many good guys. Uh, he's had some close fights, some close losses. He had some some really good wins. If you look at his uh, his one fight against Pineda, that was a no contest uh, when he was coming off the loss to Bryce Mitchell. Um, he was beating Pineda from pillar to post, and it ended up being a no contest from an eye poke. Um, but that was a fight he clearly, clearly was on his way to winning. I mean, it wasn't even a contest. Then he comes back and he fights Joe Anderson Brito. He gets knocked out there. He got a little, you know... Um, uh, he got a little lackadaisical there, but even there, when he got knocked out, it wasn't like a knockout where he was out and they got, you know, they got him up and he was like, he didn't know where he was. He literally got knocked out. They stopped the fight when he was in the middle of, you know, getting grounded, and pounded, and he literally just popped back up and he walked up over to his corner like, dude, I can't believe that just happened. So it wasn't like a knockout. It was almost like he got lost in translation. He got clipped. He went down. Jordan the Sombrito pounced and. He just can't, couldn't swivel his way to safety. So they stopped the fight, but he was coherent. He was there. So it wasn't like he got starched, knocked out, like his chin failed him. Um, you know, and then he comes back and he fights Bill Algio. Now, when you fight a guy like Bill Algio, you have to be tricky. You have to understand, you know, range management. You got to understand angles. You got to understand how to set traps, when traps are being set for you. Algio is a very tricky fighter. This is a guy who I called his fights in Ring of Combat. I was actually ringside, cage side watching Bill Algio as I was calling his fight. So I know how good Bill Algio is. We still haven't seen the best of Bill Algio. Um, but super, super good fight. Very, very technical. Both of, the guy, both of these guys were, you know, landing nice head kicks. Both of these guys were creating good angles, good traps, utilizing the entire real estate of the cage. It was a very, very entertaining fight. If you guys haven't seen it, definitely go check it out. There was one point in time where Feely actually had his back in the third round. And how Algio didn't tap from that rear naked choke is beyond me because that thing was pretty friggin' deep. Um, but he fought beautifully in that fight. Like I said, the Joe Anderson Brito fight, we didn't really get to see much because he ended up, you know, get, the fight ended up getting stopped. But if you look at the sample size from just the Pineda fight to the Algio fight, it's almost like Feely took a late surge, a late step in his career with his talent, with his skill, and kind of wrapping it and putting it all together. This is a guy who fights very long. He fights off a very good jab. A lot of people label him as an orthodox fighter, but he's not. He's a switch fighter. He switches on and off the southpaw very quick and just as fluid as he does fight with orthodox. Uh, he's got a nasty head kick. He's got good kicks. He's got, you know, a very long rangey strikes. Uh, and he's got a nasty, nasty check hook that when you're coming in, he'll, he'll just catch you with it. Um, good wrestling, very good entries. Uh, his submission game is, 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 is a little bit more advantageous than creating it, but he's got a good wrestling game. He's got good control. And like I said, his entries are very, very good. If you look at his entry against Algio, it was seamless, it was picture perfect. Um, so he's a very good fighter. You know, Feely's a very tricky fighter. Now on the other side, you look at Nathaniel Wood. This is another guy who really, really, I mean, this is on his side of the pond. Obviously the crowd's going to be in his favor. A lot of the fights that he's watched have been very entertaining. He's got very good boxing. He's got underrated grappling. You know, the best fighter that he's beaten really is is, is Charles Jordan, which is a, a good... Jordan, Charles Jordan is a good fighter. <clears throat> you know, before that, he beat Rosa. He lost to Kenny. He beat Castaneda before that. So he's beaten everybody that they're kind of put in front of him outside of a couple blips on his radar here and there. The issue I do have with this fight a little bit, though, is a lot of people aren't looking at this. You know, he's coming up to 145 in this fight. He's going to be the much smaller guy. Andre Feely is going to have about five inches of height, five inches of reach. He's going to be the bigger guy. He's automatically, you know, Feely is bigger for the division already, uh, where, where Nathaniel Wood is actually going to be small for the division. So, you know, in space, I think Feely can keep range, can keep space, can kind of keep him honest with the jab, switching on and off, not allowing to get his tempo, not allowing to get his timing down. Uh, and I think he could cause problems for Nathaniel Wood. If they get into the clinch, I think he, can, he is strong enough to kind of tear this to the ground, get on top and kind of, you know, uh, maintain some, some, some semblance of, uh, of ground control until, you know, Nathaniel Wood does get up because Feely does not have an innate ability to hold you there for long. He does have an ability to get you there, 
but he doesn't have a great ability to kind of just hold you there. So I do expect Nathaniel Wood to be able to eventually escape and eventually get out. But this is a fight where a lot of people are on Nathaniel Wood, and I understand that. I get it. He's a prospect. He's fighting over the pond. The kid is really good. The kid's really talented. He gets better every fight. But now he's coming up in weight when he's going to be small for this division against a guy who is naturally big for this division. Uh, I like Andre Feely in this fight. I think Andre Feely could pull off an upset here. I think this line is completely off. I think it be, should, should be more of a pick em. I understand, like I said, baked in a little bit is it's on the other side of the pond. People do look at Feely as he can be a little bit chinny. He can be caught. Yes, he absolutely can be caught. One thing about Andre Feely, sometimes he does stand a little bit too straight up when he throws his punches and he doesn't really protect that chin. So if Nathaniel Wood can kind of slide in, slide underneath, clear that range and crack him, he does have the power to knock him out or at least put him in trouble and put him in a situation where maybe like a Joe Anderson Brito, the, the, the ref will step in and stop the fight. But, you know, I, I like the paths for Feely here. I think if Feely really, really engages in the wrestling a little bit, becomes a little bit of a bully in there, goes back to that that those alpha male roots, I think that he can absolutely win this fight. So I'm going to go Andre Feely with this fight. I'm going to go with the dog. I'm going to go Andre Feely by decision. All right, before we get into this next fight, guys, please like the video, comment, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification button. We got a lot of content coming out this week and next week. We got some big boxing that we're going to be covering. We got the Inouye fight. Uh, we got, we got uh, Spence Crawford coming up, so I'm going to be doing videos for those. Don't miss out on those. If there's going to be uh, something crazy that happens on this card, I'll do a react excuse me a reaction video so a lot of stuff is going to be filtering and we have an interview that i'm going to be posting as well i was able to sit down with mike straka um and and punk ass from um from tap out clothing talking about the history of tap out you know how it came about um the the, the, the life and times of what he's doing now um and just back in the day the history of the ufc it's a really really good interview he's he's actually a really good interview uh, very interesting. So like, subscribe, comment, comment on the uh, on the video, and definitely hit the notification bell uh, for when our videos do come out. Um, and before we jump to this as well, we do have Christine show Christine Showdown's dog pick of the week, which we're going to show right now. All right. So now we jump back in, and basically what we're talking about. Here is two very good grapplers. This is grappler versus grappler. You have Andre Muniz versus Paul Craig. Now, those of you that remember Paul Craig, he kind of really started surging onto the scene with um, with that submission over uh, Ankalaev. Um, and it was pretty insane because Ankalaev was beating him from pillar to post the entire fight. And with seconds left, this guy just throws up a triangle and ends up submitting him and he taps. I don't know why he tapped i don't know why he just didn't ride to the horn it was a clear 30 27. it was only a couple seconds left but literally he locked it up and he tapped i don't know if he, i don't think he realized how much time was actually on the clock that's the problem i really don't think he knew because i think the 10 second clapper went off before the submission even went up you know so he literally just got locked up and he tapped and and it was it was incredible to be honest with you but this is a guy who is an extreme advantageous grappler, but he does also know how to create things when he's on the ground. Um, his striking is not good. This is a guy who can be chinny. He's intimidating looking. He's big for the division. He's got some decent front kicks. He will use his, ki his kicking game to kind of keep you honest and keep him away from you, him until he can find an entry to get into onto your hips and somehow get you to the ground. And when he gets you to the ground, unless you're seasoned, it, there's an issue. He's going to give you an issue. This guy is a very seasoned grappler. He knows what he wants to do before he actually does it. He finds ways to make it happen. He finds ways to curl you up in certain ways so he can make it happen. Uh, and he's done it time and time again. Um, but he has fell too much in love with his grappling to the point where this guy will fall to his back and literally wait for you to jump in your guard. And if you're an idiot, you're going to jump in, into his guard. But if you're not an idiot, you're going to stand and you're going to wave him up and he's going to have no choice because the ref is going to call him up. So that's kind of the Paul Craig scenario. The problem with his grappling abilities here is that he's fighting a better grappler. He's fighting a guy in Andre Muniz. He's a third degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, very, very well versed on the ground. Uh, and what people are going to look at here in this fight is they're going to say, well, hold on a second, lad. You're telling me that he's a better grappler than, than Paul Craig, but he got submitted by Brendan Allen. He did get submitted by Brendan Allen. You're absolutely right. But Brendan Allen is also a black belt under Daniel Wanderlei. And um, that black belt means something. That's number one. Number two, Brendan Allen also has hands. 
Matt Hughes said back in the day, and it stands to be true, you're a black belt until you get hit once in the face, then you're a brown belt. When you get hit twice in the face, you're a purple belt. So on and so forth, and that's the absolute truth. I don't care what belt you are. If you can't take a slap, and if you, if you can't figure out how to defend punches, kicks, and elbows, and forearms, and still create offense with your Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it doesn't really mean much. And that's the truth. Tournament grappling and gi grappling is completely different than when you're in the cage. It's completely different. It's completely, completely different. You could be the highest pedigree grappler, but if you can't defend punches and kicks and elbows and stuff like that while they're coming and being rained down on you, that's not happening in tournaments. In tournaments, you're, you know, you're grabbing sleeves and you're, you know, you're, you're grabbing the gi and you, know, you don't have to worry about anything but... If I make a mistake, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna sweep me or something like that. You don't got to worry about a, a, an elbow coming into your nose and breaking the bridge of your nose or getting your teeth knocked out. You don't got to worry about none of that stuff in tournament grappling. You got to worry about that in, in, in MMA. So there, that's, that's the big difference. So don't always look at, well, he's such a great grappler. You got to look at, yeah, he's a great grappler, but does this guy have hands? Can this guy actually take a smack? And is this guy going to be... Um, comfortable with shooting for submissions, going for arm bars, going for triangles, you know, and stuff like that, and, and, and transitioning and exposing himself offensively, I mean defensively, for the betterment of a submission when he knows he's going to be getting drilled in the head a couple times. So that is why the, 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 the situation with Muniz is a little different because Allen does have hands. Allen knows how to use his hands on the ground and on the feet. Paul Craig doesn't. Paul Craig is so deficient on the feet and with his hands that Muniz don't have to worry about that. Muniz is a very good striker, and he's also a very good grappler. There's not a path here for Paul Craig unless Muniz really just does not take him seriously and just completely shits the bed. He's a better grappler than him. He's not going to outsmart him on the ground. I think there's a situation where Muniz can possibly submit him, maybe drop him and, t and, j and jump his back and, and sub him. But there's also a situation where Muniz just knocks him out because, like I said, Paul Craig can be sat down very, very easily. I don't see a situation that Paul Craig takes him down and literally outgrapples him. I, I, I don't, I don't see it happening. If it, it, it can happen if if something bizarre happens in the cage, but it's not going to be from like a setup. I, I just don't see it happening. I, I really don't. And usually, if you're going to submit someone like Muniz. You're going to have to clip him with something. You're going to have to hurt him. You're going to have to put him down. He's going to have to be shelling up and defending, and, re and then you can lock something up. But Craig just doesn't have that ability. There's nothing about Craig striking or his stand-up that's, that's so threatening that, you know, Muniz isn't going to be, you know, confident enough just to kind of march in and get what he wants. So I like M Muniz here inside the distance. I think he either knocks him out or submits him. Um, and like I said, I would be. this is a fight I would be shocked if Paul— I'd be ex extremely impressed, I should say— if Paul Craig gets by uh, Andre Muniz here. Uh, this is going to be a really good fight. This is going to be a fun fight too. Jai Herbert and Ziam. Um, you know, I went back and forth on this little this fight a little bit. And the reason why I go back and forth is is no other reason but on the Herbert side. It's like, I, I don't know if I can trust this guy's chin. Um, you know, he's getting up there in age now. And this is a guy that has shown deficiencies in a lot of different spots in a lot of his fights. Um, he's a very clean striker. The guy's very sharp on his feet. He's fast. I mean, this is a guy who, you know, when he fought uh, Toporia, he hit him with a, with a head kick that literally anyone else probably would have been out. And when they asked Toporia what was the hardest shot he's ever taken in MMA, he says, Jai Herbert, that head kick. He's like, I was literally out for a minute. Um, it was so clean. It was so good. And he's not afraid to pressure the pocket. He's not afraid to come forward. Um, despite being clipped and despite being rocked a few times and, and, and that chin being exposed because his fighting style is straight up. He likes to throw that jab. He likes to lead it out. He likes to lead it out. It sets up his head kick. But in, you know, when you're throwing that much and you're, you're kind of just relying on your jab so much, and you're not covering your chin and you're leaving it on the center line, somebody like Taporia is going to come in and he's going to expose it. And Taporia ended up recovering, coming back in the next round, going to the body that chin was sitting on the shelf and he just capitalized on it with a beautiful beautiful knockout that just literally folded jai herbert so you know that's the deficiency with herbert but if this guy can stay clean he's got to fight clean like herbert's the type of guy that has to fight clean he could take a few smacks early on this isn't a guy that you're just going to clip him once and he's going to be out like a paul craig but this is a guy that if if, if you accumulate a couple clean shots on him that durability bar just starts going. And you just start seeing backing up a little bit. He's not pressuring with so much confidence. 
But in the beginning, this guy moves forward. He, he's got pretty combinations. He ties his kicks and punches together very, very well. He's got good speed. He's got, he uses his length very well. Um, you know, but Ziam is just solid. Like, this is a kid who literally, he, you want to talk about somebody that works off a really pretty jab. Not only does he sit there and he pops the jab, but he doubles up on the jab. This is a kid who, like, literally, and, he, and as he's doubling up on the jab, he's moving. He's moving east and west. He's not sitting in one spot and pop, pop. He's kind of gliding off the center line and he's cracking you and he's cracking you. He's looking for his next angle. That's what's so pretty about Ziam's fighting style. And he's also got very good leg kicks. And if you remember the, 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 the fight against Kyle Nelson, when Jai Herbert fought Kyle Nelson, Kyle Nelson was kind of peppering his legs up. Wasn't really checking kicks all that well. So as much as I like the movement of, of Jai Herbert, as much as I like his game, there's just more of a functionality and fundamentally sound striking style in Ziam's game. It's just a little more, more sturdy when you look at it. You know what I mean? And if it, I know it may not make sense to you when I say like sturdy, but there's just more of a foundation, a, a, a solid foundation in his game. He's a better technical striker. He creates angles a lot better. He has a rhyme and reason why he's throwing the jab out there where Jai Herbert kind of just uses it, you know, to, to, to back you up and create some space. You got Ziam doing it as he's shifting off angles to create other angles. Um, he's a really, really good technical striker. So I think this is going to be a close fight, but I think eventually, I think eventually what's going to happen is Ziam is just going to try and kind of lose him in translation a little bit. It's probably going to sting him a little bit, you know, going to, going to throw him off. I think the angle, I think the, the, the him jumping on and off on the angles are going to, are going to, you know, take precedence. I think if he utilizes the, the low kicks that, that Herbert 10 doesn't really check all that well, I think he kind of slow him down, and he will then start dictating the pace of the fight. So my official pick here is going to be Ziam. I think this is going to be a good fight. Like I said, I've been going back and forth on this one. <clears throat> but I think Ziam can win this in any kind of situation where Jai Herbert needs to have it his situation. He's got to dictate how it's going to go. He's got to be the one pressuring. He's got to be the one dictating the pace. That's when he fights good. When you start putting him off on his back foot, or you start making him guess, or he's you know looking east and he's looking west, and he's, he's kind of backing up, that's where I think he gets kind of lost. And I think Ziam is that guy. Ziam is that guy that's going to utilize his jab. He's going to double up on his jab. He's going to keep him honest. He goes high and low with the jab. He just doesn't keep it to the head. He'll go head, body, head, body, body, head. He's a very, very clean, clean striker. So I do like him in this fight. I think he's going to, I, I think there is a possibility that he does knock him out. But I think worst case scenario, you're looking at a 29-28 um, win for uh, Ziam. So that's the main card. The rest of the prelims, we got some really good fights on the prelims. Um, like I said, guys, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. We also got boxing videos coming this week. Um, but definitely, if you guys want to see my full breakdowns, you want to see all 14, 15 fights, uh, wagers, DraftKings analysis, um, you name it, we got it. Uh, private, private live stream, private Discord, a uh, uh, full-blown hour-and-a-half podcast before the fight. Even if you're not wagering or playing DraftKings, but you just want to kind of learn the process and and, 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 and get to know the fighters before the fight, uh, it's actually pretty cool. We got an awesome community in there. Everybody is tight-knit. No attitudes, no egos. It's a more mature gang that we got in there uh, and some very, very sharp dudes. So I look forward to seeing you guys in there. If not, I will see you next week.